High schools all across the country are facing historically high dropout rates. As bad as this is for all kids, this failure falls disproportionately on the shoulders of African-American boys. Public education, once the great leveler, is failing black boys at a rate that by any measure has now reached crisis proportions. The question is, will all Americans be willing to do what it takes to change this reality? Somebody tell me what M stands for. I think uh, in many ways, black males become America's litmus test. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't found a way to begin to address their needs, uh, it becomes a destructive force in this nation. Uh, our streets become littered with violence. Uh, we fill up prisons. But more importantly than that, we look at these kids as if they're expendable. We have to stop looking at these boys as if they're scorecards of achievement. W.E.B. Du Bois said a long time ago, don't view these boys as scorecards of achievement. Uh, recognize their humanity, because parents do not uh, give birth to scorecards of achievement. How do you deal with a very difficult topic like racism? Dr. Alfred Tatum heads up a literacy program for high school students at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Now, take this to your right. Never again shall we embark on our journey with more failure and unforgiveness in the act of being inconsiderate than affectionate. How old are you, young brother? 13. 13. Powerful. Powerful, powerful, powerful piece. He's one of many educators grappling with how to reverse the alarming dropout rate among African-American boys. It's a challenge Dr. Tatum says the country must face together, regardless of race or ethnicity. What is the connective tissue that brings us all together? And if I don't address the needs of these black boys, it will come back to haunt us all. Is that you as a baby? A 40-year public education veteran, Dr. Arlene Ackerman was, until very recently, the superintendent of the school district of Philadelphia. Under her tenure, Philadelphia was just one of dozens of cities working to close the achievement gap between black and white students, particularly when it comes to boys. Recent studies say we begin to lose students as early as the third grade when kids go from learning to read to reading to learn. If they don't acquire adequate reading skills by the time they get to high school, too many will simply give up and drop out. Let me start by jumping right into this, uh, asking why it is that there are schools that are low performing in the first place. Schools are asked to address, unfortunately, things that we even haven't figured out in the larger society or we refuse to do, we don't have the will to do. Things like health care for young people, homelessness for young people, um, a variety of issues, violence, violence that often, you know, is in the neighborhood and brought into the schools. In Philadelphia, we found that when we address those issues, that these young people show dramatic improvement, and it doesn't take a long time. And so it's really important, I think, that we take a look at all those preconditions for learning and make sure they're in place, and then, then our children can learn. In Philadelphia, this means nine Promise Academies under the supervision of the city's school district and funded in part through grants from the U.S. Department of Education's Promise Neighborhoods Initiative. These public schools take a holistic approach to education, extending the school day, providing extracurricular activities, bringing in mentors, counselors, and reaching out to parents to help with family and community issues. What we did was to put social workers in those schools to connect the families to social services. We put extra teachers in those schools, counselors, um, uh, nurses, so that these young people, all of the conditions that we know have to be in place so that young people can learn. For all the good intentions as this school year starts, the city's $35 million budget shortfall has limited the growth of the Promise Academies to only three new schools, nine fewer than the district had hoped to put in place this year. And Dr. Ackerman, who has also led school districts in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco, is no longer the superintendent here. She recently stepped down in part because of her controversial stand regarding teacher seniority. Well, I absolutely believe that they should be the best and the brightest. And really, it doesn't matter to me whether, they're, you know, they are coming right out of college or they've been in this district. The teachers have been in this district for 15 or 20 years. We want the best and the brightest. And those who are committed to working with a population of students who've been underserved, there's a different kind of commitment. It's harder work. 
it takes longer hours. It's Saturdays. The teachers who teach in these schools go beyond the call of duty. And we're just looking for those who are committed, who want to do this challenging work and can get results. We form major relationships with our young people. Principal William Wade is one of Philadelphia's top educators. The focus on each individual child is different than what you see across the country. Let me, let me cut in. Mm -hmm. Where black boys are concerned specifically, mm -hmm. what are the signs for you as a mm -hmm. leader, as an educator, as a principal, mm -hmm. that teacher X, Y, or Z isn't really ready to deal with this particular contingent? Well, the early warning indicators for me, first of all, uh, African-American males are very intimidating to some people mm -hmm. um, because of the things, the, the baggage that they bring through the front door. It causes them to act out in classes when they are falling behind academically. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to run a young man out of your classroom or run him out of your school. But the true work, the true gist of our work as educators, how can we work with this young person to improve their learning, which I challenge all my teachers to do. But when uh, the te some teachers held grudges with these young men because of some baggage that they brought in. They're victims. They were victims of society. And you have to recognize that as an educator and remove those obstacles. Talk to them, build relationships, build trust, offer your assistance, and at the same time, educate them. I've never heard of students, black males or others, mm -hmm. referred to as victims. I get the point you're making, but what, right. do you, what do you mean by that? Well, they're victims of several things that plague our urban areas. Um, the high crime rate, uh, things that they have witnessed, uh, single parent homes because of uh, fathers or mothers being incarcerated. They're victims of some things that they should not be exposed to. Some things that they didn't have control of. Mm -hmm. So they're victims of society because this, they, didn't, they didn't write it this way. As I came to Promise Academy, I, just changed, like, I spent some time with two boys in particular, Brandon, age 16, a junior, and Jamil, age 17, now starting his senior year. Each struggled in their previous schools. Each came to Principal Wade for help. Each is now succeeding at Robert Valk's Promise Academy. So uh, let me start with you, Jamil. How, how has the experience been? I liked it at, at first, and once I heard how it was going to be, I didn't think I was going to like it for real, for real. But I gave it a try, because I was at Boone at a disciplinarian school, mm -hmm. and there ain't nothing like this. What had you heard about it before you came that you think you were not going to like? The uniforms. The uniforms. You weren't, you weren't down with that? No, not. Uh, this my first year actually wearing a tie. Yeah, see, a next is not so bad. No, I ain't. And getting ready for the real world. Yeah. Yeah. So, Brandon, what's the experience been like for you so far? I would say that it's great. Mm -hmm. I came from a school where it was hard to be focused on, like, like for a teacher to just focus on one student or for mm -hmm. a principal, anybody just focus on one student. So the experience was better for me just being as though it's better in my life because I came from, like, just acting crazy, like, getting kicked out of school, switched around. I came here, met Mr. Weed, and he started, he started talking to me, like, I'm going to break you, like, I'm going to get through you. He's like, we're going to help you out. I got a good team, and we're going to be supportive. So, like, the experience, like, it was, it was real good it was just for the mm -hmm. simple fact that it's like they care. Why, at such a young age, um, had you, prior to coming here, found yourself in trouble? When I was in middle school, I just was just going off of anger. Like, mm -hmm. if I get mad, I'm, I'm just black. Like, I just do anything. I mm -hmm. wouldn't think about the suspensions and none of that. And now that I'm here, I wish that I did, like, knew back then. Like, I should have listened. Shouldn't have been getting in trouble. Shouldn't have been talking back to the teachers and stuff. I appreciate your honesty, first of all, that prior to coming here, you really didn't like school. Um, there was a point in my life when I didn't like school either. So what happens inside of a black boy, a young black man in your case, um, that allows him to go from hating school to being anxious to come to school? So why do, why do you like going to school now? What happened? What changed? They listen now. Mm -hmm. I, I could talk. I could, they could hear my side of the story. Usually, like, I get in trouble. Nobody want to hear my side of the story but my mom. Well, you know, your mom going to listen to you regardless. Yeah. But now here, like, principal, they listen to you, the counselor, the teacher, they hear your side instead of just taking the fellow staff side or something. I did not see... I want to think about this. Yeah, I did not see a black man in the classroom until I got to college, and that was my second year. I was a sophomore in college before I ever saw an African American instructor, a black male instructor. Black male instructor. You all are fortunate, I think, to have an African American male principal here. What's it mean for you um, to see a black male authority figure who listens to you by your own admission, who cares about you. What's that mean to see a black male every day? I would say being as though I don't have my father in my life, excellent, like excellent role model for me, like somebody I can like really look up to and talk to. Like, so I look at that as like a big, that's a big thing for me, like, cause I can just go to him and talk to him about anything. Like, so to me, he's an excellent role model. <laughs> On a 
hot Saturday morning, I met up with Jamil on a basketball court near his home. Jamil, his good friend Martin, and I played a game of horse. Layup's got to start working. There we go. After indulging me for a while, Jamil, a strong athlete, finished the game with some decisive moves. Oh, my. <laughs> you know you're off of that. <laughs> the game won. We began walking the mile or so from the park to his family's home, passing the disciplinary school he attended before Vox Promise Academy. So how much time did you spend over at this school? What, like fifth, sixth, and seventh grade? You used to be saying once you make it to high school in there, you ain't gonna never get out. Right. <laughs> but that was just a saying. I thought I really was gonna have to do that, but that's when I just thought, no, I gotta get out of here. I'm not graduating from boom. I gotta do something. Right. I gotta make something happen. I can't keep getting in trouble. And every time I got in trouble, somebody, like, you too smart for this. Right. Like, you too intelligent. You need to be doing something good. You a leader. You need to be leading in a positive way instead mm -hmm. of negative way. You have brothers and sisters? I got seven sisters and one brother, but I only live with two sisters. You live with two sisters? Okay. Yeah, I only got two of them and one, so. I got you beat by one. <laughs> there are 10 in my family. How many uh, have gone to college? One. Girl? My sister. Yeah. So you'll be the first, you'll be the first male. Yeah. First male, I think first male in my family. I don't think my granddad graduated. See how much a role model you can be? Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's important. See, part, part, of what, part of what black males are up against is not having the right kinds of role models in communities like these. Yeah. So it's important, you know, when you have the opportunity yeah. to make a statement and to do something historical, it's important that you, that you uh, take advantage of it. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is home. Yeah. How y'all doing? Hello. So Denise, you like you like the school that uh, he's at now, the Vox? Yeah, it changed the whole lot yeah. from where it used to be, as far as the teachers and stuff. When I go visit him at the school, or vis which I don't have to go like I used to, I used to be there every week, like yeah. three, four times a week. Uh -huh. But now when I go, you don't see no children walking through the hallways. Everybody's in class. They in uniforms. They doing what they supposed to do. And it seemed like the um, teachers and the principals and the vice principal they different too. Right. They not like. So much, every time I go up there and ask him a question about Jamil, it was so much negativity. But now when I go there, I don't get that from the counselors or the teachers or the principal. I'm going to come back in a few years to visit. Uh -huh. And when I come back, he better have his picture on the wall. That's right. When I graduate, I need my diploma. I need two. I need one uh, craved in the wall somewhere yeah. in Vox. <laughs> and I need one for my house. <laughs> so y'all so had the phone tree going on. So y'all were calling each other, waking each other up for school? Yeah. Brandon lives just a few blocks from his classmate, Jamil. When you guys are out of school. A gifted artist, he lives with his mom and his 11-year-old severely handicapped brother. This is a beautiful, I love these murals. Philadelphia got so many great murals, I love them. They just got finished this month. It, oh, this is a new one? Yeah, it's new, they just got finished. It livens up the area. It's just uh, beautiful. Yeah, because you know art speaks, so you know. Yeah. Art got his own yeah. thing to say to people, different people. Yeah, art does speak. That's a powerful phrase, Brandon, art speaks. I was talking to Jamil. We were talking about the responsibility that he has to be the first black male to graduate college in his family. So that's following your footsteps. Following your footsteps, exactly. So that's Jamil's story, being the first boy in his family to finish college so he can set a pattern. Your situation is a little bit different because you got a younger brother who has Down syndrome. Um, and I, I wonder what, you know, what, um, what kind of burden, what kind of pressure, what kind of responsibility that puts on, on you. It's a lot of responsibility, like being as though my mom can't focus all her attention on uh -huh. me when something happened because right. she still gotta take care of my little brother. Like, so it's kind of hard to like manage with my little brother. And then she got me, like, and then he got always got doctor's appointments, like surgeries and all kinds of stuff. So it's a lot of pressure. That's why I try to just stay out of the way and do like the best I can do, just to go, just do everything right. Like, you go to school, don't get in trouble, just do my work, so she don't gotta worry about it to come up there or me getting locked up or something. That's why I'm just trying to keep putting my mind to like the right stuff so I can focus on better and not worse. What kind of pressure, if any, do you feel uh, in North Philly, in the neighborhood, trying to stay focused, trying to get an education? What kind of, you feel, you feel any pressure? Or? If you know how to like, like just to separate yourself from like the dumb stuff and the violence and the, the drugs and you know how to separate yourself, then it ain't even hard because they're your friends, so you can chill with them and all that. But when you see what they about to do, you just slide off and you just go your separate way. So it's not no pressure. And most of them, when they see me, they, they supportive, like when they not doing nothing dumb. Yeah, yeah. Cause they want to see they like like since we they older they older than us they just they just want us to just do better than what they doing so uh -huh. so the guys you hang out with now your friends most of them are 
interested in doing the same things that you're doing, or are you are you pretty different? Going to college. Most of them, yeah. Most of them, yeah. So, most so of them. you're hanging with people who want to go the same place you're going. Yeah. I tell people, I tell young people all the time, the only way to get somewhere is to hang with people who are going somewhere. Going somewhere. Yeah. If you're trying to go somewhere, you got to hang with folk who are going somewhere. If you're trying to go somewhere and everybody they're around push you, you to get you there. Exactly. For now, Jamil and Brandon are getting the chance they and every kid in America deserves. The question is, can we replicate this success on a mass scale and reduce the dropout rate? Why does one have to fight so hard, struggle mm -hmm. so hard mm -hmm. um, to educate inner city youth? Why, why, why the fight? Mm -hmm. Uh, the fight is uh, aligned with resources, and right now we're living in a time when we don't have a good record. But these programs are working. This particular student is destined for greatness. It's tough to be placed in a leadership role nowadays in these types of movements. You have to be proven, and you have to show a dedication to the success of young people. And I do, and you know, I'm a hybrid. I, I am one of them. I came from the same situation. I'm not saying you have to come from my same background, but you do have to sit down and study and know what you're up against and be truly dedicated to the cause. It can easily go left or right if you don't uh, focus around young people, the, the urgency of what needs to happen to be successful in life, and that's what we're doing now. How do you call yourself? Me llamo. Me llamo. Okay. Looking at the crisis of keeping black teenage boys in school begs the question, is there something about black boys themselves that makes them harder to reach, that puts them disproportionately in special education classes or in detention, all of which contribute to boys getting disillusioned and dropping out? Dr. Juwanza Kanjufu has been looking at this very question for more than two decades now. He works with various schools around the country, including Urban Prep Charter School in Chicago, and says educating boys all comes down to literacy. Unfortunately, 80% um, of the children placed in special ed are not there because of ADD or ADHD. They're there because of a reading deficiency. Uh, and part of the problem is that girls and boys mature at different levels. And our school system expects white and black boys to learn how to read at the same time as girls. And if boys can't do that, then the alternatives are remedial reading, uh, special education, and eventually uh, to drop out. Uh, so I think, Tavis, the million dollar question uh, for this century, for this decade, is the issue of literacy. Are American schools in a position to teach black boys in particular uh, how to read? Because, for example, there's a stat that's frightening. If a child has not mastered reading by first grade, they have less than a 20% chance on graduation from high school to graduate on grade level. See, schools are designed to teach reading or how to read K2 and then what to read from the third grade on. So what happens to a boy who has not learned how to read in preschool or K-2? So if the issue, and I hear you, if the issue, Dr. Kanjufu, is literacy, and specifically whether or not the American public school system is in a position, is capable of teaching black boys how to read, what is the answer to that question? Tavis, you and I like to read, but we don't read everything. Mm -hmm. uh, people read things that are of interest to them. Uh, the research shows that boys like reading uh, books that, where the characters include themselves in it, uh, technology, uh, sports, uh, hip-hop culture. This is an argument we heard repeated in every city we visited. A major factor contributing to the dropout rate is that black boys do not see themselves in the assigned reading and that too many history texts ignore the accomplishments of people of color. Your book's here, and I see your book's over here as well. Walter Dean Myers has written more than 50 novels, many of them aimed directly at African-American boys. A high school dropout himself, he later got his diploma. Myers is something of a legend among teenage boys who recognize their stories in his narratives. Books transmit values, mm -hmm. and if I'm not in the books, what are you saying then you about my value? value. Yeah. My stories don't have to be good stories. Mm -hmm. All they have to be is stories which reflect their lives. That's all it has to be. If it, be, if it reflects their lives, they will 
find a way to go through that book. We don't know what intelligence is out there. We don't know what genius is out there to, to, to cure cancer or to cure Alzheimer's. We don't know that. We have to be able to now turn our heads to this young kid over here in Chicago and in, in Birmingham and Memphis and see that same genius. Mm -hmm. If there was no color on earth, what would that be? What color would that be? If it wasn't gray, black, white, nothing. Well, gray. I, I say it would be gray. gray. I think It'd be clear. Well, then everything's Gray a color, color then. Color. Everything's a color. No color. Urban Prep in Chicago is an all-boys charter high school that gained national attention because all of its first graduating class was accepted to college. Both President Obama and Secretary of Education Arne Duncan praised Urban Prep, but recently there's been a backlash because the overall test scores for 11th graders were not significantly higher than other public schools in Chicago. But for those who support what Urban Prep is trying to do, like Dr. Juwanza Kanjufu, the issue goes far beyond what test scores can measure to broader issues. Are students being given the tools they need to learn and reason on their own? And are they seeing examples of positive male role models who can help shape their lives? What you're raising now really are cultural issues and whether or not our public school system is culturally competent to teach black boys. Urban prep, other schools like it in this country are almost singularly focused on that uh, and they know how to do it well. But is our, our school system in this country culturally competent enough to teach black boys? 83% of America's teachers are white and female. Only 1% are African-American male. Only 6% are African-American. So literally, a black boy could never experience a black male teacher. Not true here at Urban Prep. Two things. First, best thing that happened to you this year, and your number one goal for next year. Good skills that help you take a test, and next year, my goal for next year is stay above 3.0 and stay consistent. Be more attentive as a student. My goal for next year, just to talk more and participate in class. Very good. Good goal. Point number 18. In defense of white females, though, it is not the race of the teacher nor the gender. It's expectations, time on task, and classroom management. I love that most of you are very focused, not pulling out. Thank you very much. But if you have boys who are having challenges at home, I mean, only 28% of our children have their fathers in the home, uh, a lot of issues with regards to parenting. Um, those schools like Urban Prep that are successful, it has become more than a job. It's almost like a ministry. It's a mission. And in fairness to teachers, not all teachers, white and black, are willing to make that commitment. Dr. Kanjufu advises hundreds of schools in low-income neighborhoods across the country and sees criteria that should be replicated. Those schools are well above the national average. And what they have in common, they have a principal who's the instructional leader. Uh, their curriculum is culturally relevant. Uh, their pedagogy is congruent with children's learning styles. Uh, they, they've been able to harness negative peer pressure and turn it into cooperative learning. Those uh, best practices work. And that's the scholarship yeah. for this. For this senior class. Three million. Wow. Jabrice is one of the boys benefiting from those best practices. <laughs> Unpack what he brought to Urban Prep, and you get a familiar story. I always in trouble, not getting good grades. Mom always had to come up to the school. Mm -hmm. Came to Urban Prep, uh, changed my life for it. Uh, started getting good grades, and become a more intelligent man, seeing the future, wanting to go to college, and becoming successful. I'm fascinated as to, to the work these schools do to turn the lives around of these young black men, but I'm even more curious as to why you were getting in trouble and what that was about before you got to Urban Prep. So why, why, were, you, why were you constantly in trouble? Why you got your mama coming to school all the time, Jabra? Well, I believe it was the girls. The girls, okay. Uh, That's a good answer now. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you go and get in trouble, you know, that, that's, that's not the worst answer, but it was the girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here in prep, you don't have to 
show how you can be yourself because mm -hmm. you're around all boys. So there's no one to actually try to be cool for. If Urban Prep has done anything, it has debunked the notion that some hold that these young black boys cannot learn. Tell me more. Yeah, I'm probably proudest of the fact that nationally, I think we've been able to draw attention to the one idea that you know, black boys are in crisis and that we have a serious, serious problem. Mm -hmm. And two, that there is a solution, there is a way out. Now, I would never argue that Urban Prep is the you know, end all be all, it's the silver bullet, you know, it's you know, the, the thing that's gonna save every single boy in the country. But certainly I hope we're a model for what can happen and what is possible. What's the first thing that you do before you do anything? I think it's essential that these guys have a diversity of positive black male role models in their lives. And Urban Prep, we don't do any race-based admissions of our students. We don't do any race-based hiring practices at all. One of the great things about being Urban Prep and being unapologetically Urban Prep mm -hmm. is folks know what we're about and people come to us. So we end up getting a really high number of African American males apply to our program to work here as teachers, as mentors, as administrators, and staff members. I have to tell you, you know, Tavis, one of the, you know, things that people don't realize about the importance of this is it's not just about the quantity, but it's also about the diversity of these black men. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important for our students to be able to see different types of black men getting along. I mean, I, I say that a lot, and I don't think people really get it. So often, we see black men in the media, black men on the streets, in combat, mm -hmm. fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And here, we've built an organization where we've got black men, short, tall, fat, skinny, you know, all kinds dark of skin, dark, light, light <laughs> all kinds of religions, everything. I mean, and it's important for these guys to see that diversity in black men and see those black men getting along. I think that that is an essential element of uh, the level of success we're able to have here. We respect ourselves and we also respect all people. Like the schools we visited in Philadelphia, Urban Prep expects that these boys will not only graduate from high school, they'll also make it through college. We believe in ourselves, we believe in each other, we believe in our prep, we believe <laughs> Jabrice has his sights set on the University of Georgia. People, when I tell them I go to Urban Prep, they look at me like I'm a celebrity. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, many people, I guess you could say, the little Obamas, that's what they all look at us at. Little, little Obamas. Little Obamas. <laughs> that, that ain't the worst thing. No. He is the president of the United States. Yes. <laughs> he did go to Harvard Law. Yes. <laughs> we have students at Michigan State and, yeah. you know, Northwestern and North. I mean, so there are a bunch of schools. I would, I, I would assume, though, that every year, though, the swath of schools that you have kids at is growing. It must, I mean, the, the, yeah. the list must be growing. Yes. It's one thing to brag about the numbers of getting them in. Mm -hmm. How prepared are they? to get out, because you know as well as I do, somebody is watching your right. numbers. Yeah. And in a few years, there's gonna be a big story yep. Yep. about whether or not these boys actually made it through yes. once Urban Prep got them in, right. did they get out. Not only do I think they're academically prepared, but I also believe that they're socially and emotionally prepared, which frankly, in my view, is the most important point. I mean, you can score whatever on the ACT, be it at the high end or the low end. But if you can't figure out how, when you're on a college campus, to deal with a wider and often whiter, hostile world, if you don't have the self-possession, self-confidence, self-awareness to be able to function on that college campus, you're not going to be successful. But for some, even the most resilient can meet a reality that just overtakes their lives. This is Oakland, California. The crime rate here is almost triple the national average. Despite conflicting ideas about how to save public education, what no one disputes is the direct correlation between high school dropout rates and the adult prison population. The less time a boy spends in high school, the more time he'll spend behind bars. There was a study done several years ago in California prisons that talked about similarities of adult inmates. 
And yes, there's similarities of race, of poverty, of them having been in the juvenile justice system, but the biggest similarity of all traits was low educational achievement. That what made the biggest thing that predicted you being in a prison in California was that you dropped out or low ed educational achievement. We took our cameras to the Alameda County Juvenile Detention Center. On any given day, more than 2,000 teens are either detained or under the supervision of the juvenile justice system. There are so many people, when you raise this subject matter, who want to pontificate <laughs> and want to lecture uh, and want to proselytize. Um, but you're different than most people in this work because you yourself mm -hmm. Uh, at one point where uh, we're caught up in the system. Unfortunately, by the time I got to high school, I was in the foster care system, in the juvenile justice system, um, and making bad decisions. Uh, been arrested a few times, was on probation in Alameda County. Ironically, I'm now the chief probation officer in Alameda County. Um, but ultimately, it was being around the wrong people, not interested in school, um, and having too much access to, to negative influences. Uh, but for the first time in Oakland Unified School's history, they had a black studies class. And that class and that teacher began to make a difference with me. That teacher became a mentor of mine, um, first kind of male role model positive that I had, and ultimately a question that was posed to me, which was, where will you be in 10 years? And when I thought about people I knew who were older doing the things that I was doing, and jail or death wasn't options that appealed to me. Uh, um, and so I decided that if I wanted to change my outcome, I had to change my actions. Change your actions to change your outcome. That is what Chief Muhammad is now trying to get the teenage boys under his supervision to do. We brought together a group of these young men to discuss some of the challenges they face in life. Some are incarcerated, some are just under supervision. For each, staying in school was not a priority. What was it about going to school, going to class that made you not interested in, in the first place? It was interesting to me, but I just wasn't paying attention to the teachers. So help me understand that. It was interesting, just but you like, weren't paying attention. So yeah. why not, if, if it's interesting, why not pay attention? Because, like, grew up, like, when I was eight, my sister got killed in front of me. You feel me? Not going to school, getting suspended, kicked out, and uh, sent back home and stuff like that. And I appreciate you being so open and honest about that, because that's a traumatic experience that you don't have to talk about. So thank you for, for opening up about it. Since you went there, let me ask you a couple questions if I can. Um, how much of what happens to young black boys in Oakland or elsewhere you think has to do with being emotionally traumatized in one way, shape, or form when they're really young. Watch somebody getting shot or something, seeing a murder. Yeah. Somebody with a gun in their hand or something like that. Yeah. You think that happens for a significant number of young black boys in Oakland, that they, that they get emotionally traumatized in that way? Most of them. Most of them, yeah. yeah. Talk to me, go ahead. I was gonna say the same thing he said, most of them, mama. Yeah. Traumatized. Yeah. Every day, some every day somebody getting popped. You feel me? Yeah. For real. Basically, like the things you see on a daily basis. When I was in like fourth grade, I had a teacher who told me I wouldn't go never amount to nothing. Mm -hmm. So when I was told that, it was like I was filled with anger from that. It was just like I mean I just seen a lot of stuff too. Like my pops went to jail in front of me. So the teacher, the teacher in the fourth grade telling you you weren't ever going to be anything, you you bought into that lie? No, I didn't buy into it. It was just like, it got to me. It got to you. Emotionally. Yeah. Like for a teacher to tell a student that, mm -hmm. I mean, you're supposed to embrace your student for me, make them feel good about itself. But with that being said, emotionally that hurt. Yeah. So how does being in here help? Does it help or does it hurt? It helps sometimes. It, it helps sometimes? I'll come to you once, I promise. It helps sometimes. Tell, tell me what you mean. Like, we could be out there robbing somebody, killing somebody, or something like that, getting shot at, get killed. Then up here, helping everybody, like, you feel me now? Settle down, think what they got to do right. Get along. Get along with each other. So you can get along in here, but you don't get along in the streets, outside the building. How, how does that work? Well, it's like you kind of have no choice, because, like, we're locked up together every day. It's like, it gets kind of old just to like, by every time I see you every single day. All right. And people just get used to it. Yeah. You can't be having a great time in here. I mean, it's a great program to help rehabilitate brothers and give you an opportunity to get you off the street and save your life. I get all that. But you can't be having fun. I mean, I don't know that there's anybody in here who would rather be in here 
as opposed to not being in here. So once you get out, why come back? It's like if you ain't got no role model, you're gonna keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. How much of this is about feeling like the world is against you, that you don't have people on your side? I wouldn't say everybody against you, because a lot of people got people that's on their side, it's just as you're willing to listen. Yeah. Are you willing to take that yeah. positive advice that they're giving you? Most people not, though. Like, they say they're listening, but it would go through one ear and not the other. Is there a feeling of embarrassment? You tell me the word. Feeling of embarrassment, a feeling of humiliation um, when it comes to your families. I hate seeing my mom come up here and have to visit me like this. I got a younger brother and younger sister, so I ain't, I'm not a role model to them. I can't tell them what's right from wrong, and I'm already doing stuff that's bad, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Let, me, let me just ask you a, a very direct question. Do, do you all think that education can make the difference? What's the value that you place on education? I mean, you, even though you've gotten yourself in some trouble, do you fundamentally believe that education can make the difference in the lives of black men? I think it can because it's the one of the main things nobody can take from you. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're like super educated, no one can like go in your brain and take that out. You know, right. like you have that forever. Yeah. It could give you anything you want, like, you know, you want your AA, your BA, anything like that, you could get a good job and everything. Well, as if somebody that's not going to school, messing up and everything, you're going to still be in the, in the streets. Like, you know, you're not going to have no education or anything, so what you going to fall back on? A lot of stuff, people don't realize the good in it at the moment, mm -hmm. but usually, like, a couple years down the road, people do. Because people say that to me a lot, and I'm like, why are you telling me that? I don't care. But then, like, after, like, like this whole jail situation, whole, like, group home stuff, like, I learned so much that I wasn't even doing on the outs. Like, I'm doing, I'm way more productive now and stuff. Yeah. So I learned a lot yeah. from a bad situation. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Making sure that all these boys get at least a high school education while under detention is one of Chief Muhammad's priorities. 17-year-old Jonathan dropped out of school in the ninth grade but finished high school here and began classes for a two-year associate's degree. Every day that you're here, I encourage you not to give up on your own humanity, not to give up every day on your capacity to improve yourself, to get better, to learn to read, to educate yourself, to advance yourself, to get degrees. When Jonathan turns 18, he'll leave Juvie and go to San Quentin. He says he'll complete that two-year degree while he's there. It's a promise he's also made to his mom. If he does, Chief Muhammad has singled Jonathan out for a challenge that may one day be policy for other juvenile offenders. Upon Jonathan's release from prison, the probation department will help him get into a four-year college and ensure that his tuition is paid. How long will you be in San Quentin? Three years. Three years. Yeah. How are you mentally handling that? I mean, knowing that in a matter of weeks, months, you're going to leave this place with a bunch of youngsters and be with a bunch of men in a place like San Quentin. Really, I don't believe there's anything that could prepare you for prison because, I mean, nobody wants to go to prison. Nobody knows about, you know, because it would be too agonized to cope with the fact that you can be a prisoner. But nobody really knows how prison is until you go there, mm -hmm. not even us. So I, I try to cope with the fact by just, you know, being myself. I mean, keeping my mouth closed, really, and minding my own business. You scared? Not yet. I don't, I don't believe it has. Well, not yet. It's, I believe that it hasn't dawned on me yet, like, or maybe I will never be scared, I don't know. But it's kind of like, like in our neighborhood, it's like prison is just like, it's the norm. So it's like, oh, you going to prison. It's not like when people, it's like college. For some it's, people. It's crazy. What makes you confident, Jonathan, that when you get to prison, um, that you can stay focused? Uh, I'm sure you can, I believe you will, but I'm just curious as to why you are confident enough um, to believe that you can stay focused on this goal that you've set for yourself once you go to San Quentin? My drive, my motivation. Knowing what I know now, like, as I said before, this is, like, it's really enlightening. I would never, could nothing stop me from this. I'm going, I will be in college when I get out. I will have my AA. It's not like, oh, I'm going to do, I will. Mm -hmm. So by 2013, I'm, I'm going to be in college. I will be doing this. It's a goal, but it's reality for me. It's nothing else. It's, I can't fail. Mm -hmm. This is too important to fail.
too important to fail, a statement worth repeating. But can our educational system meet the challenge? I was at a conference one day and I heard somebody say, if Benjamin Franklin returned, the only institution he would recognize is education, because that's the only one that hasn't changed in hundreds of years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's for all children. Mm -hmm. The city of Oakland, I think it's 30% of black boys who enter the ninth grade graduate. That is an epidemic. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a condemnation on all of us <laughs> as public officials that we can't do better uh, about our black boys. 300 miles or so to the south, a community-based program called the Los Angeles Conservation Corps is taking up some of the slack left by shrinking state assistance budgets and increasing demands. The Corps provides transitional green jobs for young men and women who agree to go back to school and get their diplomas. I dropped out because I, um, my mom went to jail for a little bit. Um, I had to leave school to basically just take care of myself. That's an assessment we heard often as we talked with young men who had dropped out of high school, the need to earn money. For Malcolm, without family to turn to, having a way to support himself was crucial. I really felt that if I didn't have no money, I wasn't going to be able to take care of my business in school because it was like, how, who else was going to take care of me? If I didn't have no money, like, how was I going to be able to feed myself or even just take care of myself, period? Malcolm, who just turned 20, graduated from high school this past June and is now enrolled in a community college. This is the same path 16-year-old Walter is on right now. So in psychology, once you see a pattern, you try to say, hey, I've seen this pattern before in other people. As part of the LA Conservation Corps, he attends the Youth Opportunity Charter School in Los Angeles and earns money while staying in school. For Walter, the Corps has provided the consistent guidance and attention his family could not. My childhood was rough, you know, drugs and all that. Moms, parents on drugs, getting moved around. And, and I seen the action that the adults in my family were doing, and I just wanted to prevent myself from doing that. At first, it was hard because throughout first to about eighth grade, it was real hard. I kind of fell down. Like my mom, she went on her addiction and she was gone for about two years. And you know, I really loved my mom, so I wasn't really used to it, but I still had to face it. I still mm -hmm. had to fight it and I stopped going to school because I just felt it was too hard. I didn't know what to do without my mom. I go to school, they say something about my mom, I was fighting them. Didn't want to hear nothing that the teachers were saying or nothing. I was just, I was, angry inside. Friends steered him to the Conservation Corps, and today, with his mom out of prison, Walter's on track to get his high school diploma and then go on to a community college. It's a very small school. Mm -hmm. It's like a family there. Everybody knows everybody, and, and there's a lot of good programs there, a lot of opportunities. The thing I really like about the school is that they don't really give you a choice. <laughs> like, if there's opportunities, you have to take them. They really do a lot for us. While every person is unique, the boys we spoke with for this report share a great deal. First and foremost, they struggle to find a way through all the negative influences that surround them daily. Justice for some, liberty for none, at least with the mates. We'll end where we began, with Dr. Tatum's literacy program at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Every summer, he conducts a seminar for teenage boys that emphasizes writing skills. Through the stories they write, these boys find a positive outlet for some of the anger that too often dominates their lives. I have heard a lot of voices in my lifetime. After hearing the voice, I was filled with sorrow. I, I kept thinking to myself, there was a little girl slowly dying and nobody's helping her. She cries and cries, but no one hears her tears. At first, she fooled me. She may act as if nothing is wrong, but I looked into the soul and found the truth. So now I, so now I hear the voice. I refuse to sit back and watch that little girl die. Now, reader, you must ask yourself two questions. Are you going to let humans die, or are you going to save those crying souls? Comments. It shows that compassion and holding justice towards others. 
really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many of the young boys initially write from a space of turmoil, mm -hmm. uh, vulnerabilities, uh, things that they see in their day-to-day uh, uh, -day existence. Uh, but quickly, uh, they began to move to broader issues to sort of figure out uh, or make sense of the things that's affecting their lives and in their community. And then they begin to realize that the issues they're wrestling with is the issues that we're all wrestling mm. with. They just uh, uh, provide a very different uh, uh, lens on there that uh, oftentimes is ignored in, in many uh, educational spaces. Given the work that you are doing, you don't believe it's too late mm -hmm. uh, to save these young black boys and hence, for that matter, mm -hmm. save the country by sure. saving them. I sure. get that. I could argue, though, on the data, which could be interpreted that black folk and consequently black boys are so far behind now, mm -hmm. pardon my English, that we ain't never gonna catch up. Well, I, I can argue back in many ways that uh, it's important to take a different lens. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm at the point where I, I, I'm not willing to beg anyone else to uh, move or advance the list of them black boys. That's why I involve them directly. Mm -hmm. It's about self-determination. Stop capitulating to the same images. Uh, you have to become your own best advocate. No one may love you more than you love yourself. Mm -hmm. at, at the other point of this is at some point, there will be a generation who follows. A and you now have a different level of responsibility. So if you're going to move toward manhood in very, very powerful ways, how do you do it to protect your posterity mm. and not waiting for other people to come and rescue you? Rescue you says, you are helpless. I need someone else. I want you to restore the strength that you've always had historically. We are black brothers united, not thieves nor junkies that steal to feed senseless, senseless addictions. We are addicts that steal knowledge to feed our minds. We are not dim, senseless fools, but intelligent men beyond measure. We seek higher learning through education and study rather than skill on the field. We move in the direction of progress, not in the direction of idle confusion. And as black Americans, we accomplish dreams through work in our reality. I think we've had some national legislation, for example, No Child Left Behind, and more currently, Race to the Top. Uh, in many ways, have not, uh, and Race to the Top is, is, is relatively new, mm -hmm. but it has not been able to move the needle in terms of advancing their literacy development. It gives license. Uh, to expose black boys to less because now we have stati uh, uh, statistical data that says they can't do certain things based on these uh, assessment indices. What part of speech would that make? I think the most important thing is uh, don't become overly concerned that a kid struggles in third and fourth grade uh, and ride them off. Uh, their struggles in third and fourth grade becomes their identity. So we have to juxtapose two things. If a kid is vulnerable, how do I think about instruction ways to nurture their resilience? And as an educator, I have to accept culpability. For all the different approaches to reducing the dropout rate we found while doing this report, there were some overarching similarities. Adults who care and boys who realize that whatever raw deal they were handed a solid education can give them the tools they need to change their lives. And of course, educators who refuse to give up. I say to people every day, it's like putting on armor and going to war. And I see it as going to war, but it's such a great cause. Seven. I didn't get here because somebody didn't go to war for me. I'm standing on the shoulders of lots of people and I'm two generations away from grandparents who never finished the sixth grade, two generations away from um, grandparents who cleaned other people's houses and were domestics, and I graduated from Harvard. I went to public schools. So I believe that public schools are the foundation of this American society. It's time for us to step up. These young men need our shoulders now that they can stand on. We came away from talking with these educators and the boys themselves with some obvious truths. First, education doesn't happen in a vacuum. Families and communities do need help. Second, teachers deserve all the support they can get, including access to professional development and respect for the hard work they do. 
Third, black boys need to see themselves in our country's narrative, or too often school doesn't make any sense to them. Fourth, they need positive male role models who can help them shape their lives. Fifth, boys need to know that they are expected to succeed. And finally, test scores can measure only so much and can overlook inherent abilities in every boy. There's no mystery to solving this crisis. Solutions rest with adults who refuse to let kids fail. And when that happens, boys succeed. The challenge for all of us is to recognize that educating these boys means a better future for every American. Put simply, public education and the kids it serves are too important to fail. Thank you for joining me. Keep the faith.